or lunacy, or perhaps even order. In a series of programs whose overall title is States of Mind, I suppose that it's rather odd that there's so little reference to madness or lunacy, or perhaps even odder that the one program which is devoted to this subject should consist of an interview with someone who insists that mental illness is a myth invented by psychiatrists. Well, ever since the 1960s, Thomas Zatz, who was the professor of psychiatry at the State University of New York, has been at the centre of an angry controversy, which is the result of his claim that there's no such thing as mental illness, and that the medical profession has appropriated the concept of madness and has thereby given itself a license in the name of humanity to imprison and treat people whose behavior seems either inconvenient or revolting. Well, as far as he's concerned, of course, madness exists, all right, but it has nothing to do with medicine. And by putting it into the province of clinics and asylums, he insists that the medical profession has paralyzed our understanding and our sympathy. It's unfortunate, perhaps, but when someone coins a vivid slogan, they often become associated with it. Your name is associated with the idea that mental illness is a myth. Uh, I wonder if you'd like to start by saying exactly what you mean by the myth of mental illness and how this myth has arisen and assumed the control of our lives that it has. What I mean by it... Uh it's really easy to explain, especially to a British audience. I have really relied on Gilbert Ryle's uh, fundamental concept of a category error. And what I mean by the myth of mental illness is that the kidneys uh, can be sick, the liver can be sick, the brain can be sick. And sickness, in the modern scientific sense, uh, adheres to the notion that there's something biologically amiss with a part of the body or, or the body, various organs. Now, since the mind is not an organ, since the mind is, at best, an abstract noun, mm -hmm. it cannot be sick. So that mental illness must mean something quite different than what it seems to mean, namely that it's an illness like any other illness, in the phrase of American psychiatry. That is their slogan. Mental illness is like any other illness. Well, the one thing we know about it is that it is not like any other illness. In fact, it's not an illness at all, in my view. So you're saying, then, in Ryle's sense, that we've mistaken the categories of illness by applying the category of illness to the mind and insisted that uh, that the mind can be ill in the same way that the body can and you feel that this is uh, is logically wrong as well as as it were empirically or objectively wrong that is correct now we can uh, get right into it it is a mistake only in a very benign philosophical sense since it's not really a mistake since I believe that virtually everyone knows that mental illness is not like cancer and heart disease. So it's in a way a tactical mistake and the whole history of psychiatry has to do with the fact that it's not a mistake at all, it's a particular way of using language to gain certain practical ends. Uh, and that really then has to do with the question of what do doctors do, what do surgeons do and what do psychiatrists do, what have they done historically? Because, you know, again, to use philosophical concepts, I mean, mm. in the tradition of modern empirical science, a word means the habits it engenders, the habits mm. it characterizes, that's what words mean. You know, there's no point in looking them up in dictionaries, that's mm. all right for foreign word means, you've got to know how people actually use it, that's what it means. Well, how and when, then, was the notion of sickness applied or misapplied to the mind? Uh, when can you first recognize the use of or the misuse of the pathological category as applied to the mind? Well, that is really uh, rather easy to answer and it ties right into my general argument. That is the idea of illness applied to the mind in the sense of mental illness in the modern sense really is coeval, occurs about the same time that the idea of bodily illness occurs. Now, the idea of bodily illness as we know it is not that old either. And without going into too many details, uh, let's just remind the viewers, as it were, that up until almost the 18th century, really, uh, doctors, philosophers, had the idea that the body was ill when there were various disturbances in humors, the so-called humoral theory. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't really until after the 
Enlightenment was in high gear, really, let's say 1800 is a kind of a watershed date, if one wants to think of something, 200 years ago, roughly. Mm -hmm. And really not until 1850, when microscopy developed, that the idea clearly developed that illness is tissue damage, it's a bodily illness. And it was during this period that the idea of some vague concept of madness, which of course goes back to antiquity, but it's a very different concept, it was only during this same period that the idea of mental, Ill mental illness began to develop. And this then ties in with another development, namely of what do psychiatrists do, I think we should bring that right in here, mm -hmm. namely what did psychiatrists do? Well, they operated institutions called madhouses or mental hospitals in which individuals were confined, presumably for the treatment, ostensibly for the treatment of their mental illness. But of course, that wasn't the real reason. But prior to the identification, uh, the custody of the uh, of the mad was not, as it were, legitimized in terms of illness or sickness, but simply in terms of the protection of the person. Saying that with the advent of pathological notions of tissues and organs in physical disease, that this uh, area extended to include madness, and therefore the mad person was now put in custody having been defined as a sick person rather than just simply as an aberrant one. That's correct, but Dr. Miller, uh, as you know, and uh, as historians have shown, and this is now well known, that actually, uh, although madness, the idea of madness was abroad uh, in various Western cultures, there were really very few mad people, and the, uh, when you speak of the custody of madness, there really was no such thing. There were no madhouses, mental hospitals to speak of before the middle of the 18th century at all. I mean, in England there was Bedlam, which was an institution for miscellaneous purposes for poor people, vagrants, and so on. And uh, well, uh, If we go even further back, let's take, uh, I like to cite, uh, let's say, classical Rome at its height, had almost two million people. And there were no institutions for housing. Uh, taking care of mad people. Same thing in ancient Greece. So there was no such thing. Mm -hmm. The idea of, uh, the, both the idea and the number of mental patients grew up parallel with mental hospitals and psychiatrists. Th these three things, the buildings, the psychiatrists and the patients all grow together historically. So you're saying then that the patient is a creation of the profession of psychiatry? Entirely. And the so heretic is a creation of the theologian. Mm -hmm. Obviously, until there is a, an evangelical religion, there are no heretics. And you're <laughs> also uh, in, in insisting then that the, the um, is the consequence of the misapplication of pathological ideas to the mind. Now, why do you think uh, in the middle of the 18th century uh, it became necessary or attractive to, uh, to categorize the mad as being the expression of sickness rather than as some other denomination? Well, that ties, we already covered it, and with the development of Western culture, urbanization, the problem of paupers, of poor people, vagrants, the growth of theories. And what do you do with the problem of mental illness has always been and continues to be, in a nutshell, I'm oversimplifying now, mm -hmm. but this is the core problem of people in society who are somehow, who can't make it, who are somehow outside of it, and this is captured very nicely in the old-fashioned English term, alienation. Uh -huh. They are alienated, and the doctors were called alienists. This is what it is about. But given the fact that this developed in Western society, close to the 18th century, there was a question of, already people had some sense of human rights. You couldn't just take people off the streets and lock them up, unless they were criminals. Mm -hmm. And here were people who were not criminals, they were eccentrics, if you like, they were crazy. Now what justified their locking up? Illness. This illness is the justificatory rhetoric of the modern world, like God was. From AD 400 to AD 1800, it was God and religion. If you said that with the cross, you could go all over the world and kill people and enslave them and have slavery and everything, it was all for God. Now we do it all for medicine. Lock up people all over the world. If it's done in Russia, of course, people in Britain and America say this is awful. They're locking up dissidents. They're not locking up dissidents, they're locking up schizophrenics, they say. But long before they did it, people did it here in England and in America. Mm 
They said, we are, trick we are not locking them up, we are hospitalizing them. But of course, they were simply locked up in prisons called mental institutions. And that's where they are now today. You go on to, uh, to insist then that, uh, and that this is a, a, a disguised control and, and, and really... I believe that, but let's, not, uh, let's, let's go a little slower because mm -hmm. it is both a tyranny and a protectionism. There's a large element of paternalism in here. And I want to soften, although I am not uh, retracting my position on that one iota, it is a tyranny, but at the same time, like so many tyrannies, uh, it provides, it satisfies a genuine human need, partly in society, to remove these persons from society, from the families where they are unmanageable, and also it satisfies a need of taking care of people who, in fact, in some ways, do not take care of themselves. That is, the analogue of the people, perhaps, who are on the streets in Calcutta, Mm -hmm. Well, you can't be living on streets in London or New York. Well, then they are in mental hospitals. And many of these people don't have any other place and they really don't mind being there. And if mental hospitals, to the extent to which mental hospitals are halfway pleasant, uh, psychiatrists often have trouble getting people out of them. They are genuinely homes for the homeless. They are orphanages for adults, for homeless adults. But it's medicalized, and that is the reason why they are economically ruinous and conceptually unmanageable in our society. Because everybody's looking for an illness, but there is no illness. But um, is it merely because it's economically unviable that you regard the medicalization of um, uh, madness as objectionable, or do you think that there's some more fundamental ethical reason for, uh, for, uh, for removing the medical from the domain of the insane? Both of those, and let me say something about the objections which I have to this medicalization and to really what psychiatrists have done and continue to do. And again, without uh, distorting it, perhaps caricaturizing it a little bit, uh, I would like to describe what psychiatrists do in the following way. That is, after all, uh, let's, let me first say what, you know, the ordinary person would think, and correctly would think, what does the doctor do? Well, what does the surgeon do? Well, a surgeon operates. That is, just like a violinist plays the violin, uh, and an architect designs building, a surgeon operates. And a physician, a, gy a gynecologist, an internist, makes diagnoses and makes recommendations and gives medicines. Now, what does a psychiatrist do? Sicarius does really basically historically two things. He takes innocent people and deprives them of liberty. That's called civil commitment. Now ostensibly this is done to take care of their mental illness, but in fact this is what he does. He takes people who are innocent of any law breaking. I'm now talking very much in the tradition of British and American law. People may be depressed, unhappy, whatever, that's not illegal. And these people get locked up. At the same time, the second thing which a psychiatrist does is that he goes to court, typically, and pleads and claims that people who are murderers, often mass murderers, like the Yorkshire Ripper, they are innocent. So he locks up the, the innocent and frees the guilty. This is what they do. This is the core function of psychiatry. And since psychiatry has become so overawed, it is precisely the absurdity of this function which gives it its power. Well. If I can take the legal case first of all uh, and offer an objection, um, wouldn't it be true to say that until the abolition of capital punishment, at least, the psychiatrist was not in fact proving the innocence of the mass murderer or the murderer or whatever, but he was in fact exercising a humane function in at least offering some sort of maneuver because at least it saved these wretches from the gallows. Um, that in that sense, the psychiatrist was in fact exercising a humane function and not simply uh, inflicting a medical category on, uh, on someone who in fact who ought to have been punished. He was, uh, he was softening uh, the violence of a very vindictive law. That is, uh, you know too much. <laughs> of course, that is the history of it and that's absolutely right. That is the way it happened. And that, by the way, is one of the reasons why psychiatry has acquired the mantle, and there are similar analogues to that today with respect to abortion laws, for example. Mm -hmm. Before abortion became legal, the one way to get an abortion was to go to a psychiatrist and be declared in need of an abortion. Mm. What I used to call bootlegging humanism. 
Of course, this is what happened, and this is a humanistic enterprise. But ideas have consequences. Look what the psychiatrists did. Why didn't the psychiatrists, if they objected to capital punishment, why didn't the British Psychiatric Association and the American Psychiatric Association lobby en masse against capital punishment instead of lying about mental diseases? Because in fact what they did was very much what some Swedish and, and Swiss and Spanish embassies did in Budapest, in Hungary, to save Jews. They said these are not Hungarian Jews, they're Spaniards and Swedes. Well, what a joke. Well, anything is permissible to be saved from Auschwitz. Mm. But to then, if after the war, these people would in fact have been confused with Swedes, that would have been quite a, a confusion. But now psychiatrists insist that these people are ill. The psychiatrists who I presume testify for the Yorkshire Ripper genuinely believe that the Yorkshire Ripper kills women because he has a disease like cancer. So this is how metaphors become real. This is why I think that psychiatry is very much like a religion. It's one thing to talk about Jews as Christ killers, as some kind of metaphor, and to believe actually that Jews are killing Christ because he's still alive in the, in the ceremony of the Mass. Well, so this, this becomes a very, very live issue. Psychiatrists believe that mental illness is just as real as that table. Well, let us concede that uh, certain forms of insanity may not be so readily uh, identifiable with a physical pathology as say someone who turns yellow is identifiable with the disorder of the liver which you can discover at autopsy and say that psychiatrists have found it very hard to associate it certain uh, aberrations of behavior with corresponding disorders. Would it not be quite reasonable to say that certain forms of conduct were so consistently unrepresentative of the main mass of human behavior, like repeating and again and again in a compulsive way, was something which was so similar to disease in apparent consistency that it's only hair splitting to say that it is not a disease because you can't find some sort of organic lesion associated with it. The fact that someone does violence and does it in a way that no one else wants to or does is enough, in fact, to justify calling it a disorder, and indeed an illness. That is a very forceful and very good way of stating the argument, the, the other argument. Mm -hmm. Obviously, if my argument was the only one, it would already have prevailed and no one else would think <laughs> anything <laughs> else. Now, what you have stated is plausible. Let me only say it. Let I can, all I can do is sort of state uh, what I see is not so persuasive or not so attractive about it. And that is, first of all, it switches the ground rules because non-psychiatric physicians, biological medicine is still sticking to the idea that a disease is a demonstrable lesion, not a package of behaviors. And you have switched that ground. Secondly, you have switched the ground by and you have sort of smuggled in something by saying, well, this is something which is such a coherent package of behavior. But other packages of behavior, which we don't call diseases, of which the best example would be a devout religious behavior. That is also a configuration of behavior, which especially if you don't agree with it, let's say it's a minority religion, it's a so-called cult. Mm. And by the way, as you know, it's very popular now in America for psychiatrists to say that some of the minority religions, the cults, are mental diseases. Mm. Well, so was Christianity a mental disease before it became uh, the dominant religion? Just because it's a package. And last but not least, I think once one introduces the idea that law-breaking, violence, is a disease, then one is on the verge of destroying the entire tradition of British and American law. Namely, that disease is disease and crime is crime, rather than this Erwonian mixture. Because the question is, what is the duty of the doctor? Is it the duty of the doctor to help a patient recover? Or is the duty of the doctor to enforce the laws and punish people? Because if somebody is going to go around and kill ladies, any civilized society is going to do something to him. Now, even if it's called treatment, that's going to be punishment to anyone who uses language decently. Now, it may, everybody may call it treatment, but the subject will feel it's punishment. What do you, I mean, it's simply in the sense that their liberty is curtailed or... Um, uh, the liberty is curtailed? What more do you want? 
they may get they may get chemicals which they don't want. They may have their brains maybe be lobotomized. But even let's just stick to liberty being curtailed. What? That's it. Is is there a doctor's function? No, but it may be a doctor's function um, in cases where, in fact, there are. Uh, unpleasantly violent penalties to be inflicted for such crimes, it may be the doctor's function to exert uh, a, uh, an advocacy on behalf of the subject simply to make sure that he does not suffer. No, I don't believe that. I think, Dr. Miller, that that is mixing roles. The doctor, after all, is primarily and first of all in his life a moral agent, a citizen. Only secondarily is he a doctor. Now, in his role as a citizen, that is his job to soften irrational laws, to protest against them, to sacrifice his life, mm. or possibly to leave the country. If, yeah. you are, if you are a conscientious doctor in Nazi Germany, then the thing to do is to go to America, rather than to practice in that system. But rather in, than in some ways to mix these two issues. But in the same way as it's the function of the defense sometimes in a law court, to point out uh, sources of reduced responsibility on the part of the defendant, and those um, may be simply uh, questions of ignorance or carelessness. It may require someone who is in fact medically expert to point out more occult sources of diminished responsibility which, which arise from something which the doctor calls illness. Now might that not be a perfectly reasonable and legitimate thing to do um, in, a, in, a, in a court of law? Um, uh, the defending counsel might wish to point out that the uh, the defendant was unaware of the various uh, situations around it. I mean, he was negligent or something, um, and, and not criminally negligent. Now, there are other sources of uh, reduced responsibility, which in fact we call illness. Someone who in fact is confused, uh, is not aware of what he or she is doing. Now, it may require some sort of medical expertise to identify these often very occult sources of, of diminished responsibility. I have no objection to that. That's essentially, that cuts across medicine and psychiatry because uh, medical doctors may be involved in that also. Let's say there may be diabetes or staging our uh, scene or what's going on in the courtroom. And if we're going to respect this proceeding seriously, then why only talk about doctors testifying about reduced responsibility, which is very much what they are doing? Why don't they ever testify about increased responsibility, about aggravating circumstance? And here I have an excellent example, which is both legally relevant and historically interesting. Doctors now, every doctor in the West, certainly in America, I think in England too, would take it for granted that if somebody is drunk, is an alcoholic, he should somehow be dealt with more leniently. Mm. Well, why not? Why shouldn't that be an aggravating circumstance, not an exculpating, but an extra inculpating one? Well, indeed, it is. I mean, in, it in may, in, in, well, it may or may not be. No, it's it's, mm. it's very. But you see, doctors who testify in court in this kind of situation to exculpate are looked upon as great humanitarians, and those who testify as inculpate are looked upon as some kind of brutal enforcers. Since we do know that drinking relaxes inhibitions, disinhibits, that doctors should systematically testify that people who commit crimes, let's say vehicular accidents, while drunk, and there are some very interesting American cases in American history of what some very famous Americans have done while drunk, what happened to them? Not much. Mm. Because it's an exculpating circumstance, not an inculpating one. But it also may be an inculpating one in that, for example, it's an aggravating circumstance to be in command of a vehicle when drunk, because in fact you know that to take in drink does in fact diminish your responsibility in the way... When was the last time that a, that a British psychiatrist testified to that in court? No, it doesn't need psychiatric uh, speciality to demonstrate that, but there may be sources of diminished responsibility which arise from something other than the intake of substances. There may well be susceptibility unknown to you, so that you may, as it were, be uh, an alcoholic of your own making. In other words, uh, clinically insane. Now that may require a medical diagnosis in order to identify it properly. This is a purely hypothetical uh, situation that you have constructed because in fact no such internally secreted substances have been isolated, first of all. Secondly, let's assume that such existed which would predispose this person towards violent acts or law-breaking. Wouldn't there then remain the problem of how to deal with him or would he have more 
opportunities for breaking the law with less penalties than you and I. No, he so wouldn't have that. But he well, if he wouldn't have that, then where is the well, intervention? Why is intervention useful? Well, then intervention might in fact be required. Having been identified as a person who was a victim of such and such uh, disorder of his neurons, that he was a person who was in, had an added responsibility not to, uh, to, to be at liberty. Not to be, for example, at liberty to drive a car in the case of epilepsy. Or it may well be that the, that the curtailing of liberty had to be even more stringent. And that in the case of someone who was the victim of substances which made him violent in or out of cars, that he might actually have to be kept not merely off the roads, but off, uh, off society's back and uh, and put in custody. Now, I'm simply acting as the devil's ad advocate here, and I'm not saying this is necessarily so, but at least it's a, it seems to be to be a defensible as argument. You de but you see, Dr. Miller, as you define this devil's argument position, if you are the devil's advocate, I'm quite happy to be the devil. Mm -hmm. I, have, I am very much in agreement with the practice of not letting epileptics, as long as they have seizures, drive a car, much less allowing them to pilot 747s across the ocean or drive buses. Mm -hmm. But these are demonstrable conditions. A person can go to a court and say, Dr. John Doe said I have epilepsy. And here I have three experts and so on who will testify that there is no evidence that I have epilepsy. And let the court appoint a panel. Mm -hmm. But we are talking about things like heresy. See, how do you prove that somebody hasn't got schizophrenia? We are back to the myth of mental illness. See, insofar as we have demonstrable conditions, whether it's epilepsy or being a typhoid carrier and so on, of course, Medicine has a very important function, but again, let's keep it clear what that function is. That's a public health function. It is a function to protect society from the harm of the patient. It's not a primarily therapeutic function. And I'm all for that. I mean, why shouldn't society is as important as the individual? They're equally important. Mm -hmm. Why shouldn't physicians protect society from certain diseases, just like they protect it from radiation and uh, mm -hmm. industrial pollution and so forth? But we are not talking about that. Let's get back to mental illness. Mm -hmm. Well, let's say, when there are lots of examples, let's say that a famous American poet like Ezra Pound mm -hmm. is charged with a crime. This is ex you know, there are lots of such cases, or some Russian writer, and the prosecutor says, we can't try him because he has schizophrenia. And the defendant says, but please try me because A, I haven't got schizophrenia, and B, I am innocent. This is the real situation we are talking about. Well, you uh, seem to uh, hinge much of your argument on the existence of some objectively identifiable lesion in order to for something to qualify as a disease um, and as you say something uh, if someone has jaundice and uh, nausea and pale stools and so forth um, we expect to find disorders uh, uh, in the liver but um, let's go back to the days before the association between findings at autopsy in the liver had been shown to have an association with the cluster of symptoms with which patients presented in hospital. Now, you wouldn't want to say that of course before the, the, the liver had been uh, um, identified as the source of the illness, that patients with jaundice, nausea, um, and so forth were not, in fact, sick. Of course. Well, in exactly the same way, might it not be the case that certain consistencies of aberrant conduct and thought were illnesses, even though it was impossible at this particular point in time to find a lesion either at autopsy or else with more sophisticated... Well, let's, let's pursue that, Dr. Miller. Let's assume that there is a case that certain uh, identifiable patterns of behavior, which many psychiatrists now call schizophrenia, is indeed a very subtle disease of the nervous system. This mm -hmm. is, I think, what one could call this in very precise English. This would not be a proven disease. This would be a putative disease. Yes. All right. Let's assume that schizophrenia is such a putative disease. The question, as I indicated earlier, is what are the consequences of this? After all, there's no, no, no one is interested in arguing about words. Mm. The question is what consequences does this have? Now, it has consequences in two directions. One is what does the individual, so-called patient, do about it, and the other one, what does society do about it? Then let's spell those out. Now, in my opinion, if you're going to use a medical model, then the patient in England and America, we're not talking about Russia, then the patient is a free agent. The same way as if he has pneumonia. You tell him he has pneumonia. Mr. Jones, you have pneumonia. Please take penicillin. He says, no, Dr. Miller, I don't like penicillin. I go home and I won't, I'll take aspirin. Mm -hmm. Now, let's say you have schizophrenia, take Thorazine. He says, no, I won't take Thorazine. Okay? Next chapter.
that the sooner the gentleman goes out and kills his wife, goes home and kills his wife. Why should that excuse him any more than pneumonia or diabetes excuses him? It's a disease. He knows it's a disease, it's his responsibility. I have no objection to treating it as a disease in this way. I don't think it's a disease, but if you want to treat it as if it were a disease, then again the question is, what does this entitle you? See, the only diseases, as far as I know, certainly in America this is true, in the United States today, in New York City, you can walk around with infectious syphilis, and no doctor can get a microgram of penicillin to you. Right? Mm -hmm. Now that's a provable disease. Whether somebody has got or has not got syphilis can be established scientifically, regardless of politics, of beliefs, whether you're capitalist, communist, left-wing, right-wing, Jewish, Christian, it's objective. And even though society says you can't treat it, because the primacy of individual autonomy in medicine is more important, but schizophrenia and depression, which no one can identify, that you can treat involuntarily. So as soon as psychiatrists are willing to give up their tyrannization that you originally talked about, as soon as they are willing to give up involuntary treatment and involuntary hospitalization, I would have much less objection about what they call disease and not disease. All right. Well, if we could leave the juridical questions but on one side for the moment. we can't because psychiatry is 100% well, juridical, so we can only very theoretically leave it. No, but if we can leave the more confined aspects of the juridical in the sense of the... the juridical hangs, of, of, hangs over it. It hangs over it like a pall. Mrs. Jones, please come to the hospital nicely, because Mrs. Jones knows that it's very easy for the social workers, the way it goes here, to get her involuntarily. So as long as there are involuntary laws, there is no voluntary patient. There is no such thing as a voluntary psychiatric patient in Great Britain. I mean, Just like there is no such thing as a voluntary taxpayer. We all pay our taxes in order not to go to jail. I don't call it a voluntary act. So that you mean that, 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 that because there is the threat of involuntary commitment, the threat the and the entire history of the threat and the reality of the threat. Well, then, uh, if I can just shift it's the ground. It's not an empty so, threat. No, but if I can shift the ground slightly and say um, there are nevertheless um, the problems of helping the apparently helpless, the agonized, the distressed, and those who are not merely agonized and distressed themselves, but those who agonize and distress their relatives. Mm. Um, who, for reasons of their madness, whether you call it illness or not, are not in a position to offer themselves as plaintiffs in the way that a patient suffering from physical disease is able to do. What do you do on the basis of philanthropy, on the basis of helping in terms of kindness about such people? Um, while I agree with you wholeheartedly that there is always the threat of the tyranny of the involuntary commitment, of simply taking away someone's liberty merely because you have denominated them one way rather than the other. What do you do about those people who in fact are, for reasons which we needn't discuss, either because of brain disorder or something else, some existential disorder, have become mad, and mad in a way which renders them incapable of asking for the help which in fact a profession might be able to give? What do we do about this? Hmm. Well, we can have a conversation about this, obviously, and your question is, is uh, again well taken, and I would like to say all sorts of things about this, and will. But again, uh, let me first say that this is precisely why psychiatry is so powerful, because it is so useful. I, I love to paraphrase Voltaire, saying that if there were no God, we would have to invent him. But if there were no psychiatry, we would have to invent it, because psychiatry, in fact, comes in and does something in these existentially, humanly, very, very difficult situations. Now, whether it is as good a thing as we could possibly do or not is debatable. Obviously, many people think it's the best we can do, and in some situations, it may be the best thing we can do. Now, in some ways, we have to break down the kind of phenomenon which you described, because, first of all, you emphasized the helplessness, the, the inability of the patient to act as their own agent mm. seeking help. Now, if we really take that seriously, you see, that is not a very, that does not characterize the whole panoply of the situation. But that is certainly one part of the group that you're talking about. To the extent to which people behave that way, there is no great problem and there is no great conflict between my views and those of 
traditional, ordinary, regular psychiatrist. Because these persons then should be treated more or less on the model of someone who has been hit by a taxi and is unconscious. The ordinary channels of medicine, science, compassion and humanity should be mobilized and this person should be cared for and treated in whatever way makes sense to society, scientifically and humanly. There's no great problem. No, I see that. But Dr. Miller, you know very well that this is a minute problem because what happens very often is, and there are such people, is that although they are helpless many ways, in many ways and don't seek help, the one thing they seem to want to know and want to do is to get out of a mental hospital as soon as they are taken there. That's why they are locked, so that the people can't walk out. So although they don't quite know what to do with themselves, they do know they don't want psychiatry. Now, but this is not really a representative sample. Let's take, you know, I love to take, so that we can mm -hmm. be a little more concrete, some literary examples of these cases. Mm -hmm. Why is this so distressing? Who is a typical mental patient? Lady Macbeth. Now, what's wrong with her? That finally, the Macbeth make it to the top, and her illness has a characteristic that it upsets her husband. He can't have a good time because she's so depressed. Well, this is, this is a very difficult problem, but why is she so depressed? As a doctor, that's 400 years ago. The doctor knows why she's depressed, because she's guilty. It's a moral problem. The doctor says this is not a medical problem. But precisely what the doctor in Macbeth says is not a medical problem, is what doctors now say is a medical problem. So it's a jurisdictional question. Now, if you want to make it a medical problem, it is indeed possible to do things to Lady Macbeth so that Mr. Macbeth feels better. I don't think this is good. Now, but this is, honest people can have an honest disagreement about this. Now, psychiatrists say, but after Lady Macbeth gets electric shock, so something should be grateful that she got the electric shock. Mm. Now, that doesn't prove anything, of course, morally or empirically. Well, what this is medical, medicalization of morality. That's what we are talking about. So, so then, in that case, what do you feel ought to be the repertoire of what's on offer to those people who are, in fact, exhibiting either very florid and peculiar and distressing uh, mental symptoms or mental um, well, that's not, you know, perhaps it's begging the question to say mental symptoms, but, f yes. but f florid disorders of behavior, florid disorders of thought, which are distressing either to them or to their relatives. I would, uh, first of all, I would have to separate those two categories radically. Those are yes. two entirely different populations, sort of like what do you do with people with pneumonia and with people with cancer of the rest? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, they have to go through separate doors into different buildings, as it were. Now, people who upset other people, as far as I am concerned, in this way, schizophrenia, depression, the patient, as it were, there is a person who is disturbed, the relative. Mm. And it's for them to decide what they want to do. The upsetting person should be left alone as long as, as, long as they do not break the law. Primum non nocere. First of all, do no harm. I think it is medically, morally Im Ill incorrect to take some action against this person without his consent. Well, now, I, if he consents, yes. then there is no problem. No, but I'm, I'm, I'm uh, uh, trying to uh, indicate a type of patient who is not simply obstreperous. He's not causing distress to his relatives because he makes their life well, distressing. Give me an example. Well, I'm talking about the, the transformation of a personality in such a way that the relatives, the parents, the siblings say, not please cure my brother, sister, or father because they are making our life appalling, but please cure well, them people because... People never say that. No, <laughs> but, 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 but uh, I'm paraphrasing what they would say. But please restore to us the person whom we love. Not please make them less obstreperous, please make them less insulting, less disgusting, but we would like back the lovable person who we have uh, but I don't been know associated with all I our lives. Uh, Dr. Miller, in all, uh, uh, with all my effort, uh, and without trying to appear difficult about this, I can't deal with that because uh, a relative who would speak like that would in some way deny the complexity of human existence. Uh, how about Jekyll and Hyde? How, I mean, again, I would, uh, since you haven't given a more concrete example, let's, let's, take, this, let's take a concrete example. Here was a, a nice young woman 
uh, wonderful daughter, and she gets to be 15, 16, she stops eating. She's anorexia nervosa. Mm -hmm. And the family says, give us back this wonderful, you know, girl, who was such a nice girl, and you know, she ate, everything was all right with her, now she doesn't eat. Yes, well, indeed, well, I mean, but isn't, isn't that a, a, a perfectly legitimate and reasonable request? No, um, it's not. Because, because it denies, it denies all the reasons why this young woman doesn't eat, which from her point of view are just as good as why somebody in Ireland doesn't eat, because he is a political hunger striker. Oh, no, but there is a, surely a fundamental distinction there, in that there may well be reasons why the uh, patient suffering from anorexia nervosa is in fact deliberately abstaining from food, in a metaphorical sense, similar to the way in which the, uh, the prisoner in the H-block is abstaining from food. Um, he's trying to, to get some sort of deal. But at least in the case of the H-block, the conditions which would satisfy the calling off of the strike are clearly known. They're on the table. Surely what in fact is uh, distinctive about the anorexic patient is that uh, even if in fact it could be demonstrated that this was a strike on behalf of some sort of settlement that they were trying to obtain, it's, it's almost impossible for any, anyone other than an expert, perhaps a medical expert, to elucidate and find out what the deal is. What deal would in fact get them to call off the strike? Not so. Excuse me for being so mm. direct. Mm. Uh, this is a very nice dichotomy in a way because in the case of the Irish hunger strikers, Nothing about their motivation and their goal structure is repressed. Our society can tolerate perfectly well that a Gandhi or an, I or an Irish uh, hunger striker, who he is and why he starves himself and what he wants. But our society collectively denies that there are people, generally young people, who during adolescence have only one overriding goal and that is not to grow up. Mm -hmm. That we can't tolerate. We call it schizophrenia. That's too painful. And secondly, we can't tolerate that there are some young women who can't tolerate the idea of becoming women because they think women are second-class citizens, which of course they are, are destined to bear children, which they may not want to do, and so forth. So in effect, the deal that these young women want is of course not a political deal. It's a more subtle existence. They rebel existentially and biologically, and we are not therefore prepared to hear it, much less to meet their demands. But nevertheless, but, what you have is a situation, but, but, so, 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 so as regards the family, but, a painful and apparently uh, eventually leading to a fatal outcome of the loss. But it's not a fatal outcome. Well, it may be a fatal but, outcome. No, no, no. Now, look, you are in the, in, hmm. the, in the language, you are in the word business. When you talk about the fatal outcome, it sounds like cancer. What we are talking about is a young woman who prefers suicide to growing up as a woman. Now... In 1400, she might have been called a saint. There were lots of people who preferred dying for God or something than living. Well, that would presume This is suicide. Mm. Now, so this raises the whole question of suicide. Our society denies the legitimacy of suicide. Well, it, it's mental illness. Well, it may... Uh, it, it may I'm not, not advocating go, suicide. It, no, but it may not go as far as denying the legitimacy of it, but one can understand relatives who, in fact, would prefer it not to take place and say, please, do something but to not persuade so our daughter not to kill but herself. But relatives may also prefer somebody for a nice young Jewish boy not to convert to Catholicism, or marry a Catholic girl, or get a divorce. Now we are talking about what people in a family would prefer one of their members not to do. That's not a disease. Let's take concrete examples. Let's assume well, that your fa somebody's right. father is an Orthodox rabbi, and all the right. son comes home and wants to only have ham sandwich for lunch. All right, well, I'll accept Instead that. Instead of anorexia moment. nervosa, is that a disease too? Well, in that case, to whom do they go in order to... That's their problem. To, to, to I, am, I am just trying to bring order to this psychiatric chaos. I don't have an answer for life's problems. No. I only know stupid answers when I see them. I guess I, 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 I certainly recognize that. But then, in that case, um, let us put ourselves in the position of the, of the unfortunate uh, complainer whether it is a relative or the patient himself or herself, to whom do they turn? Now, you say it's not your problem. Whose problem is it? And no. to whom should they turn? Let me give a more respectful answer. Is it? Mm. Yeah. To whom a person turns in a life problem as distinct to a technical problem. You see, I think it's a, I think it's a terribly intellectually crippling proposition to mix technical problems with life problems. That is, if somebody has pneumococcal pneumonia 
he should turn to somebody who is an expert on treating pneumococcal pneumonia with uh, appropriate chemicals mm. to which it responds. Whereas if somebody has a problem, let's say, like uh, some family conflict over, over religion, over divorce, mm. over having children and so on, to whom they turn, if they are going to do this thing right, in my mm. opinion, should grow out organically out of who they are, their micro society, rather than out of some technical consideration. If this is a devoutly religious family, then I think they should go to a priest or a rabbi. If this is a sophisticated, not particularly religious, intellectually inclined family, they should by all means go to a psychoanalyst or a psychotherapist. If they are an organically, medically inclined family, let them go to a neurologist or a doctor and take Thorazine or Valium or have a transsexual operation. People have all kinds of strange solutions to these things. We don't know how many young women with anorexia nervosa could be cured if their ovaries were removed and they, they became operated into men. I, I don't think the government, the taxpayer now pays to take perfectly healthy men and make them into fake women and vice versa. That's called a treatment. So when you see what kind of answers should people have. So that in fact, although you have very commonly been associated with the uh, with the philosophy of Ronald Lang, I would be right in saying that really what in fact is that you are fundamentally a, a radical libertarian in your view of, um, of uh, mental illness and its, its mythology. Yes. And your belief then is that who, whoever finds themselves distressed should seek relief for their distress in some ethical source rather than in some medical one. Or some technical one, yes. I mean, just to, as a side comment on so-called anti-psychiatry and Lang Ifa, the, the most obvious difference between us is that, like I had claimed that there is no schizophrenia, they say, on the one hand, there is no schizophrenia, on the other hand, they offer a system of treatment, of management for it, that they claim is superior to other managements, which I think is ludicrous. So in a sense, they are just another sect in the larger family of psychiatric religions. I look upon all of psychiatry, its various branches, organic, Freudian, Jungian, and psychiatric, anthropologists commenting on all these various faiths, and my view towards all of them is they are all fine, practiced voluntarily without state coercion, and they are all evil, but they are enforced, like enforced religious conversion. And I also say intellectually, to my view, they are all intellectually faulty because they all seek relief along some medical, technical lines for something for which there is no relief known as life. Life is something you've got to endure and live as intelligently as you can, day in and day out. And there's no solution for it. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Thank you.